Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Steve Greer, and I am uh, very pleased to be here with you all tonight. I hope everyone can hear me fine on this conference call. For those of you who have uh, donated to the Unacknowledged film, so first I'd like to thank everyone for your contribution. And there are people all over the world who've made this possible. We have almost 4,000 donors at this point. And what I want to do over the next hour is sort of give everyone an inside glimpse of what's going on and answer some of your questions that have been sent in. There's many more, many more questions than we're going to have time for in the next hour, but we'll try to get to some of them. So uh, first, an update. We are in the phase right now where we're doing the post-production and we've uh, really been at this about four or five months after we got funding in place. So um, some of the exciting things that are happening with this film, as many of you know, there's been a number of leaks uh, through WikiLeaks of the John Podesta emails with Edgar Mitchell, who I introduced to the subject. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we're going to feature some of this in the film. We're trying to get as much in that's current as possible. The other big news is that we have a, in the category of new witness testimony that will be in here that the public has never seen. Um, there's an Air Force Office of Special Investigations uh, Lieutenant Colonel who uh, was at Kirkland Air Force Base, and we did a, a three-hour interview with him in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, in this uh, production phase of the film this summer. And during that interview, I was able to uh, get him to admit to not only uh, the government's involvement in keeping these projects secret in counterintelligence programs, but that he and others in his uh, department had provided cash payments to people in the media to get them to alter stories, stop stories, give him intelligence, etc. And this included national media. So he confirms what we've been saying for years, and that is the corruption of the uh, uh, military-industrial complex with the mainstream media, and the reason the subject has been able to be kept secret is the cooperation of the media. And this is from a guy who's going to be a name, rank, and serial number, and whose credentials are very well established. So uh, that's, that's one data point. We have another uh, witness who is a constitutional attorney who is involved with the Iran-Contra issue, the Pentagon Papers and the New York Times, uh, and also the uh, Silkwood case. And in an interview that I had done with him, he talks about the, that uh, he was briefed on the fact that there were 43 at that time, this was many years ago in 1990, people in the intelligence community who were on the payroll of the 10 largest media corporations in the world, and they represented the intelligence community to alter stories, to stop stories, et cetera. And so this is going to be you know, corroborating points with this Air Force intelligence, counterintelligence official, uh, and the two of them do not know each other but corroborate that point. The other uh, critical point, data point, that the Air Force intelligence officer provides is that he confirms that there is a false flag operation dealing with the UFO issue to hoax a threat from outer space. And he backs out of his commentary very quickly, and we capture this on camera, where he says that's still extremely secret, very top secret, and did not want to go into any details. But of course, we know from Werner von Braun's statement to Carol Rosen that they were going to hoax events um, and have been for 60 years to create a situation where people would be afraid of things from outer space to justify the militarization of space and to be able to convince the public there was a threat when there is none. Uh, the other uh, important thing he confirms is uh, the military and intelligence community and counterintelligence community involvement directly in hoaxing uh, abductions and being involved in abducting uh, humans to make it look like it was being done by uh, ETs. And he confirms this, and uh, 
of course, this is something we've been uh, we've known for many, many years, but have never been able to get in a military official to go on the record. And he is going on the record with that information, which is explosive. So uh, those are just sort of sort of some of the things that are going to be covered uh, in the film. Naturally, what everyone needs to understand with this movie, unacknowledged, is that. This is not being made for the UFO or conspiracy subcultures. It's being made for the general public. So we're having to take people from zero or close to zero in their knowledge base all the way up to this level of understanding how the intelligence community works, how unacknowledged special access projects work, who's behind it, what the agenda of the secrecy is, et cetera, and so on. It's a very tall order to do in an hour and 45 minutes or two hours in a feature film, but that's uh, that's the task at hand. The other big challenge has been going through the thousands of government documents we have and the uh, literally uh, hundreds of hours of military and government officials' testimony and getting the best ones out of all that material to fit into a less than a two-hour film. So it's it's the mother of all editing challenges, and it's, it's a really huge, huge undertaking to get this archive into a film that would uh, have the effect we want it to have for the general public, uh, again, not for the UFO subculture so much. So that's really um, what the big task has been over the last five months or so, and uh, we're, we're getting it probably towards the finish line in the next, uh, we estimate, uh, two months or so. We're hoping that by uh, the first week of December we will have all the bells and whistles done, the music score, the uh, you know technical work that has to be done um, completed. We have a very good post-production house working with the filmmaker and with me to do that, and uh, that's very exciting. I've also just gotten a, a draft of the movie poster that's amazing, the, the outfit doing the movie poster that I, many of you will receive um, is the same outfit that did The Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio and does most of the films that uh, uh, Hanks is in and a lot of other huge Oscar-winning blockbuster movies. And they're doing the, this the poster and artwork for this film. And well, there's another uh, group that's very large that's done uh, Oscar-winning movies that's going to do a trailer uh, for it so that when it comes out, uh, it will be really uh, noted in the public and in the critical media. The uh, plan, just so people get a sense of our timeline, is to try to wrap up the actual film itself and all the post-production work by the first week of December, get it to the Orchard, which is um, a distribution, big mainstream distribution um, outfit, which many of you may have heard has agreed to distribute the film, which in and of itself is a huge accomplishment. It took about six months of negotiating to get them to agree to that. And that they are going to then need about two and a half or three months before it's released to do all the preparation and the marketing and what have you. So we're looking at a release date probably late February to mid-March. Of course, that's not in stone, but that's what we're shooting for. Could be a little earlier, but, you know, that's, that, you know, you, we, we just, it, it, this is still in development. Um, so the premiere, those of you who are, would be coming to the premiere, uh, and to the after party in Los Angeles, that would be around that same time, uh, late February into mid-March or so. Um, so that's the timeline we're shooting for. Uh, it means that we would have done from concept to completion and release all of this in less than 11 months, which is quite fast and furious. So that's, uh, that's the timeline. And, of course, it's subject to change because, you know, we're – we keep having events happen where we're wanting to include new material. Um, at some point, we're going to have to end it, um, but because you know, otherwise it would drag on forever. But we we know that there are probably more WikiLeaks uh, emails coming and information 
Uh, we're waiting to see if we can uh, obtain more information on uh, John Podesta and the Clinton campaign's involvement. And uh, we already have that in the film because, you know, as most of you know, I put together the briefing for President Obama that went to, to him via John Podesta and that John Podesta, the chairman of Hillary Clinton's campaign, had been the chief of staff for Bill Clinton and got very involved in what we were doing with Project Starlight prior to the Disclosure Project in 2001 when we were providing information to the Clinton administration, which was too intimidated to push on the issue and, as you all know, um, failed to do anything about it. About a year ago, John Podesta, when he left the Obama administration, stated publicly that is the biggest you know, disappointment of being in government all these years is not being able to affect UFO disclosure. And, of course, many people thought he was joking until you went back to 2002 and saw the press conference he did after the Disclosure Project news conference in 2001 where he is talking very openly about the fact that this needs to be opened up and the secrecy ended. So that, that's sort of, you know, uh, an evolving story. There may be more confirmatory emails that come out through this WikiLeaks event. We don't know, but we're, you know, staying tuned for that. And as most of you know, we just sent out an update about that today uh, to bring everyone up to speed on the history of how all this has evolved since between 1993 and 2016 um, with, with our involvement with that. And uh, that's the, the other thing that is very exciting that's happening is that the, uh, the distributor is going to engage or has already engaged um, a big PR firm and they, uh, when they announced that they had acquired the distribution of the film, The Orchard, um, that story was covered in a lot of mainstream media and websites, as well as in The Hollywood Reporter and elsewhere. So uh, we're hoping that uh, over the next three months or so, as the film gets to completion and we begin to have a target date for its release, we'll do more of that, because our objective is to educate the public on uh, the fundamental truth that we're not alone in the universe, that we're being visited, that there are unacknowledged special access projects being run illegally, and that the um, that there is a deep agenda that's been going on since the 50s that are psychological warfare programs oriented towards convincing people there's a threat from outer space because this would greatly benefit the current power structure that is a militaristic and what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. And now that we have data points uh, and witness whistleblower testimony admitting on the record that we are uh, hoaxing a lot of the events that the UFO community thinks is ET, and it's a man-made, which of course I've been saying for over 20 years, I think this is going to really become a bombshell um, as, as people begin to realize that this is being admitted to by a government official who had personal direct knowledge of it. The, the other thing that's very interesting, and this is probably going to be a separate release from the film, is because this interview, you have to understand, this one interview with this Air Force officer is three hours, and it was three hours chock full of jaw-dropping amazing information. Um, we're probably going to have a special feature that will be just that interview um, because it, it's, frankly, you can only put, you know, a talking head of one person for so many minutes in a feature film without, fr frankly, putting the general public to sleep, which you don't want to do. You want to have something that's fast-moving and diverse. But there's so much information in that interview that what our plan is is as soon as this film is finished to be able to do a, um, a special feature uh, that can be released around the time after the film is released very quickly that would have the complete uh, unabridged uh, interview with this Air Force intelligence officer. And uh, of course there's some other uh, material that's in the, in the film that uh, from our existing archive and documents uh, and we're still in the process of, as recently as two weeks ago, 
going around to see if there are any uh, so-called free energy devices that are functioning and haven't been confiscated yet that can be featured in the film. Unfortunately, we have not found any that are currently operational and can be tested. Um, although, you know, if you get on the Internet, it looks like there are thousands of them, but in reality, there aren't. Um, so that's something we're still in pursuit of. Whether or not anything will be identified between now and closure of the, the, the full production of this film is to, to be determined. So that's sort of a, a quick update on our, our schedule and some of the things that are breaking with this film. Um, and again, I, I really appreciate everyone for supporting it. We're going to close the crowdfunding um, incentive gift program on October 20th. So if you know of anyone who wants to continue to support what we're doing, um, who wants to receive the incentive gifts, they should do so before October 20th, which of course is in uh, eight days. And um, after that, we'll still, you know, certainly welcome people's contributions. But we, at some point, we have to close out the incentive program just so we can begin to fulfill those items, as we are with this phone call tonight. Uh, the other uh, thing that I'd like for people to understand is that the the film has not gotten. Uh, we have not licensed the theatrical release yet. So one of the things we're going to do as soon as the film is completed so that it can be put in front of uh, distribution is to look at possibly having it as a theatrical release, meaning in movie theaters. Uh, that has not been even begun in terms of uh, putting it in front of people yet. The Orchard is doing the digital and um, download to own, video on demand, uh, Netflix, those kinds of systems, as opposed to, say, movie theaters. So the movie theater, which is called theatrical release, is still pending. We have some leads to some folks who could possibly help with that. We may do it as a guerrilla um, process, meaning a grassroots process, where theaters are engaged and it's a special showing as opposed to a big um, theatrical release company. Uh, it, that's all going to be looked at that probably between December and January, uh, mid-January, because you really can't get a big theatrical distribution firm involved until the film is pretty much completed and they can see what it's going to look like. Um, we were fortunate that the Orchard has agreed to distribute the film because it turns out that the uh, head of the, the, the Orchard, which is a division of Sony, uh, has been a follower of our work and a very big supporter of the Disclosure Project, which I didn't know until I met with them um, this summer. So that's um, really fortunate. Usually an independent film like this cannot get a mainstream big distributor like the Orchard to pick it up, and we were able to do it, And uh, which is the whole point of this exercise, as you all know, is to disclose the facts to the largest possible audience, and that's what our objective is, and this is going to help us do that. So um, I wanted to get to, to some of the other points people have asked uh, about, just it came in to, to my uh, production assistant, most of you have been in touch with Maggie on, on some of these questions, and I want to go through some of them. And uh, uh, before I get too far into them, because some of them relate to an event that we're going to be doing in Las Vegas on November 13th. So I want everyone listening to understand there's a special um, webinar as well as in-person event happening at the UNLV. Ironically, where the next presidential debate is happening, but a few weeks later on Sunday, November 13th, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., um, and that is going to be a intensive for three hours on the cosmic false flag that will cover a lot of these issues of who has put in to the system since the 1940s and 50s. Uh, the, the narrative and the agenda that has been laying the foundation for an interplanetary conflict. Why are they doing it? 
<clears throat> and very importantly, this is way beyond the scope of the movie Unacknowledged, um, what are the technologies being used? So what I'm going to go into on that uh, webinar, which you're all invited to join as well as the, if you can be there in person, even better, um, it's at the Greenspun Auditorium. And we'll soon send out a notice about this. It's not up on our website yet. We've just now planned this event. And we're really wanting to, to go into very deep background on the electronic warfare systems that are behind a lot of experiences people have had, how consciousness affecting technologies, so-called quantum holographic electronics that affect awareness have been developed since the 40s and 50s that have targeted people that have induced abduction states uh, and what those technologies are, how they're doing it, which corporations are involved, um, what counterintelligence uh, operations are involved, how they stage craft it. Um, and it's also going to go into a, big, a deep discussion of the so-called secret space program, what part of that is real, what isn't, uh, what the experiences are that people, um, such as um, Dr. Fred Bell, who's passed away, uh, but who I knew very well, who was an MK Ultra baby. He was given by his parents um, at birth to the CIA as an MK Ultra baby to be indoctrinated as a genius, but also to be mind controlled and what those programs entail and how long they've been going on. Now, if you Google MK Ultra, you'll see that, that there was a Senate hearing in the 70s by the church hearings, and Senator Church was appalled because MK Ultra was using LSDs and other hallucinogens. What did not come out during that hearing is are the electronic warfare systems that interface with thought and consciousness that can induce, frankly, electronic hallucinations. Um, and just to give you a, a, a sort of a sense of what's going to be at this webinar and, and that I'm going to present, in the, the early 1990s, I met a man who had developed for the, in the intelligence community an electronic system that by 1956 would enable them to completely uh, target people and give them experiences that were scripted. And this, of course, begins to explain a lot of the experiences that people like Corey Good and uh, Bill Tompkin and others that you've been hearing about have had. And these people have actually, like Dr. Bell, who is a, the great uh, nephew of Alexander Graham Bell, by the way, um, were victims of these programs but the programs were designed to create a sort of scripted Armageddon and have people have experiences that they truly believe are real, but that were completely scripted by the intelligence community. And most people have no idea of these capabilities. They need to know what they are. There are a lot of whistleblowers coming forward right now about this. And in fact, there's a whole organization dealing with the whistleblowers who have been in DARPA and different corporations, et cetera, who have, who have witnessed the, these sort of abuses. And uh, the man that I met with in the 90s who developed the early, one of the early systems uh, in 1956, so that was 60 years ago, it told me very directly that they could target someone and have them have an experience, and he uses this as an example, where they had a conversation with their personal god Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, who Moses, whoever, and that the person would believe it and that they would pass a lie detector test that it is real. And when you take that technological capability and then the government documents we acquired that talk about the hoaxing and the psychological warfare value of the UFO subject and how easy it would be to move the public excuse me, in the direction of a fear-based reaction to the ET presence. Now, a lot of people say, why would they want to do that? Well, you have to be able to acculturate people into hatred and fear to justify any war. And so something this large, as Werner von Braun said, they went through this whole period after World War II. The first there would be the Cold War, then there would be nations of concern, and then there'd be global terrorism, which, by the way, we talked about before 9-11.
And then there would be the threat from outer space. And the big one they would play would be the quote unquote alien threat. Now remember, this was planned in the 50s and was hatched. So it's been over 60 years that they have been developing this narrative. And so what this webinar is going to be about, and this lecture for those of you who can come in person, is pulling the curtain back on the Wizard of Oz that's been pulling the levers and confusing and hoaxing things for over 60 years. And I think it's very important that this be done because otherwise, uh, with what's been happening with the uh, WikiLeaks revelations, uh, the fact that you have a major presidential candidate and her chief of staff, John Podesta and Hillary Clinton, talking on television interview shows about the UFO subject. Even the New York Times has reported some of this. It used to be completely banned. I'm concerned that they're actually ramping up the timeline to hoax the big one, uh, something that would be a cosmic 9-11, a, a sort of cosmic massive false flag operation. And I think it's very important that we get, to the extent we can, uh, a warning out to the public about this and the, what the agenda is and what the means and methods, uh, as they would say in, in the intelligence community, are for hoaxing this sort of uh, event. And so that's going to be a very detailed presentation. I hope those of you who can can be there in person or join in on the webinar. So um, in, in terms of getting to some of these questions, I'd like to, the first one I'm going to take is someone asked, uh, uh, what can we, the American people, do to get Congress, the Senate, members of the Armed Forces, Vice President and President to release all UFO Area 51 and project information to the public and stop the secrecy that's been plaguing America all these years? Well, um, first of all, by supporting this project, you're doing that. Secondly, I think it's really important that because with the social media now, that everyone post to their friends, colleagues, neighbors, whoever in their Facebook and Twitter and social media network, this information that we're sending out, and find your voice to speak about it. I'm very skeptical that the U.S. Congress or the President, if they, even if they held a hearing, that they would be allowed to have the testimony of the truth tellers be at it. They would probably be at <coughs> a dog and pony show. It would sort of be sort of a staged event like all these com committees have been. Now, I think it's important that they have a hearing, but I think people need to be prepared for the fact every time they've had one, it's been hijacked by the intelligence community and turned into a dog and pony show. So. The, the, the reality of it is we, the people, are going to have to do the disclosure, and then we hope as this takes momentum, there will be support coming from different governmental circles. Uh, but I, I think that the question betrays a certain um, assumption, and that is that the Congress and the President would have access to these unacknowledged special access projects, uh, even if they had the courage and the intent to expose them. And what I have found since from 1993 until today is that most of the time, the people who are in key positions in the government and even key positions at the Pentagon who should have access to anything this sensitive do not. And when they try to get access, they're either completely turned aside or threatened. So the question becomes, how do you have the checks and balances required in a democracy? This gets to the whole concept of an ongoing campaign, which we've been engaged with for many, many years, to have whistleblowers come forward from the intelligence community, like this Air Force fellow and the others who have come forward, uh, people who can get us documents, materiel, information that's credible, and put put it in front of the public. The, the official capacity of people in the government, what's been interesting to me is that when you meet with these guys and women, I would say that with a rare exception, they know much less about this issue than any of you listening do. And if they try to get their staff to inquire, including the president, they're basically lied to. 
And this is also the case that people at the, the Pentagon that I've met with, I've met with generals and admirals at the Pentagon, very senior positions who were not part of this cabal and secrecy, who when they made inquiries were flat out told nothing's going on or were told, yes, there's an operation here because I would give them a document with the project code name or code number on it. And they would say, but you don't have a need to know. This happened to Admiral uh, Tom Wilson, who is the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It happened to the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is nearly as big as the CIA, but is the Pentagon's intelligence entity. It happened to many, many people I've met with in the Pentagon and in the Senate and House. So I, I, I think that people need to understand that even when the, there are good people who have tried to get to the bottom of this, and they're lied to, and in some cases they're threatened. So this means that it has to be a, the citizens of the country here and also overseas, those of you listening from the UK, Australia, uh, Russia, need to find people who will come forward as legitimate, credible whistleblowers and step forward and do this. And I think that that is pretty much the only way this is going to happen. Uh, and with the alternative media we have now, the social media, YouTube, what have you, we have the ability to reach enormous numbers of people um, that were not reachable in the past. And so that's something everyone can do, and it's mainly networking. It's, it's sort of like being an ambassador for this kind of disclosure effort in your own communities and in your own sphere, because I think if you begin to talk about this issue, and I do this all the time, I'll be flying on a plane and someone will say, oh, you know, where are you going, what are you doing? I'll just tell them. And they'll go, well, that's interesting. You know, I knew someone, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, it's all networking. So that kind of network building is something every single person on this phone call can do. Um, so that's, that's sort of one way of understanding this. Uh, and meanwhile, we can all hope that people who are in a legitimate or allegedly, I should say, legitimate power in the government will do the right thing at some point. Uh, but having witnessed this for 23 years, the foot dragging and the politicians, uh, let's just say I'm not holding my breath. I think it's very important that we continue to do this as an independent um, activist group of people uh, for disclosure. So. Uh, the next question is uh, related to what I started to talk about, about the webinar, and that is, uh, do we have a current secret space program operational near Earth or in deep space using advanced propulsion technologies? Um, yes, we do. Um, is it in deep space? That I'm not convinced of. I think, you know, there's a wonderful uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers song, and it says, uh, space is made in a Hollywood basement. It's one of the verses. It's quite funny, actually. And there's a lot of truth to that. So what I'm saying here is that we have had gravity control when we inherited the scientists from the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler in the 40s, and Operation Paperclip, and people like Werner von Braun and Hermann Oberth and others came over. We inherited their state of the art with electronic systems that cause so-called anti-gravity. Those were studied and then developed in development at the, at the time that we downed, uh, the, it turns out, confirmed now by this Air Force intelligence officer, three ET craft near Roswell. Now, that was a deliberate downing using a scalar electromagnetic weapon system uh, that appeared to be in a radar dome, but it wasn't. And the reason they knew they were going to be there is that there had been ET craft observing all the atomic bomb blasts up from 45 through 47. And they knew that there would be ET craft in that area because at that time Roswell was the only nuclear bomb squadron in the world. So they switched this thing on. It affected the field propulsion of those craft. They crashed. The study of those objects combined with the work that had been done by T. Towns and Brown starting in the late 20s and 30s and 40s and that had also been picked up by the uh, Germans during World War II, which, by the way, their secret weapon was not the atomic bomb. It was this anti-gravity system. So all that came together 
between 1945 and 1955. And by 1954, we mastered gravity control, so-called anti-gravity systems, um, to a large extent. And so we began to utilize that. And the, the really sad thing about the, the conventional space program, and this is also true of Elon Musk with SpaceX and Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic, and you, know, you have all these things going up and exploding and using explosive propulsion. It's basically a Chinese rocket that's thousands of years old um, with a whole lot more power, uh, and they're very dangerous, and they destroy the uh, upper atmosphere and stratosphere, and we don't need them, and we haven't needed them since the 50s. But they want to keep those technologies secret, and so there is a clandestine, covert uh, use of them where they do go to the moon, and they do go to probably some of the areas near Earth my understanding, and this is at odds with what a lot of the mythology that you hear out there from, I think people who have been given programming on this issue, uh, such as uh, Corey Good, um, I, I'm skeptical that they're allowed to go too far out into space because every credible person with firsthand knowledge I've spoken to has said that because we are viewed as a violent civilization, as Michikaku would say, we're not a level one civilization, which is the, the, the hallmark of which is living peacefully together and not damn destroying our biosphere. We're a level zero civilization. So a level zero civilization with nuclear bombs and weapon systems are not looked upon very, in a very welcoming way too far out into space. And so it's my understanding that we have had limitations placed on our ability to go there with spacecraft. Now, when you deal with consciousness assisting technologies and the ability to take someone and with these electronics, have them go out and see things in space, they may be able to see things that are real. They may be programmed to see things that are false. And this is where you have to be very careful with the rumor mill of things that you see on Gaia TV and on um, the other networks that are out there and the mythology that's built up. Because frankly, I see a lot of that as a disinformation that is part of this long-term 60-year narrative to lay the foundation for there being uh, sort of a cowboys and Indians, good, good guys and bad guys in outer space that we need to, uh, as Ronald Reagan said, unite the world uh, against uh, an alien threat. And when Reagan said that, by the way, uh, it was shortly after a man that I knew, a colonel, Colonel Holman, who's passed away, had done a briefing to get, he was an Air Force guy, to get the president's team to support SDI, the, the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars, to put weapons in space. And what they were doing, actually, is getting a lot of funding that went through the back door of sort of brilliant pebbles and other silly systems that never uh, that those were just window dressing, and they were going into these black projects, these unacknowledged special access projects, and the USAPs were taking that funding and expanding their ability to target uh, ET uh, spacecraft when they stepped down into linear space time from transdimensional, uh, hyperdimensional space time. So that's what people need to understand. Reagan was manipulated. Uh, and to saying that at the United Nations when, when he said, wouldn't our job of creating world peace be easier if we had a common alien threat to unite against? And I think this narrative, which goes back, as I mentioned, to the 40s and 50s, was the big battle that took place between people like Secretary Forrestal and Eisenhower on the one end during the 50s who wanted to denuclearize, have open contact, and move forward. And Jack Kennedy wanted to do the same thing. And the military-industrial complex, which outmaneuvered Eisenhower and outmaneuvered and eventually killed Forrestal, um, to ensure that this other agenda went forward, which is what we're living through right now. Um, and I think uh, when you look at the... the the capabilities, yes, they are there. To what extent they've been deployed, 
I'm a bit agnostic about that. Um, but certainly when Ben Rich, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, said to um, Jan Harzan, who's a very good friend of mine and is the head of MUFON International, but at the time was an uh, engineer for IBM, and two other people on my team, the head of Lockheed Skunk Works, the super secret research and development part of Lockheed Martin Aerospace, Ben Rich said, well, he said several things, but one of the things he said is, we already have the means to take ET home. In other words, that we have developed interstellar capabilities. Now, he did not say we've been allowed to go that far out there with it. So the question is, yes, we have a secret space program. Yes, we have anti-gravity. Yes, we have the physics for trans-dimensional, uh, faster than the speed of light, so-called teleportation and what have you. The question is, to what extent it has been used and allowed to be used by interstellar civilizations that are trying to contain what they view as an existential threat because humans have not become peaceful. I, and I think that begins to be the, the bigger and deeper question that nobody ever addresses. So um, these are the things that I want to go into in this webinar. It's way beyond the scope, of course, of this uh, film. Um, maybe someday we'll do a film just on this. But that's going to be that'd be so esoteric. It's it's um, if what we're doing with unacknowledged is to to get the facts of the, the most salient facts out to the widest po possible audience. Uh, what we're talking about right now would be something that would have to be um, a couple steps down the road in in terms of people being able to even understand uh, what it is we're, we're referring to. So. Um, the other, another great uh, question that came in um, uh, was, uh, can you clarify for us the issue of whether all ETs are interdimensional, or are they, uh, could there be, the so-called grades that are actual real ETs in addition to the PLMs that are man-made, the program life forms, I think they meant and made to look like the grays. So what this question is relating to is, is a bit of confusion. I'd refer folks to the paper I wrote, I believe it was in the mid-1990s, called um, uh, you know, ETs and the New Cosmology, and where it goes through this whole discussion of interstellar civilizations that can reach other star systems. Well, what that means, though, those, all those uh, civilizations are by definition inter or transdimensional. What do I mean by that? It means that if they're, let's say you're from a star system a thousand light years from Earth, which is 1% of the distance to the Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy. If you're going to go from your star system to Earth, even at the speed of light, it'd take a thousand years and then a 1,000 years to go back. Same thing for communication. It means that all civilizations that are interstellar are, by definition, interdimensional. They have to go beyond the crossing point of light, which I write about. And when you cross that light barrier, which is a phased event with electronic systems, um, it's all electronics, magnetic field propulsion, you're then going through other dimensions, and you're dropping out of linear space-time. So instead of going in a straight line from a thousand light years from here to Earth, you're basically dropping out of linear space-time and therefore compressing the travel, quote, time and distance so that you can be here. Now, when you then step down, as it were, uh, into linear space-time around Earth, you're going to come through what's called the crossing point of light back into 3D, or 4D if you count time. So all ETs that are here that are interstellar are, and it's all of them, also interdimensional. Now, to make things a little more confusing, people have experiences with interdimensional beings that are not ET. And what am I talking about? You might have an experience with, say, an angelic being or uh, your dead grandfather, 
or some poltergeist phenomenon. Well, that's someone in the so-called astral field of energy that can, under certain conditions, press into linear space-time and knock a base off a table or, or touch you on the shoulder. Now, those are, those are intelligent beings that are in another dimension, but they're not from another star system physical planet. So while all extraterrestrial interstellar travel capable civilizations are interdimensional, not all interdimensional beings are extraterrestrial. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it, this is really a very important point because there's so much confusion out there about this because what happens, people will take an external phenomenon and because the phenomenon is similar to a trans-dimensional ET, they'll confuse it with ET when it's actually something from another dimension altogether. So the reason I wrote that paper in 19, and I know nobody reads anymore, but <laughs> being, being the, being the uh, professor here, <clears throat> people do need to learn, read. So that paper is up there on our website, and it's in my first book. But it goes into some detail about this differentiation and the cosmology that involves space-time, interstellar travel, but also these other dimensions and how they're folded within each other, because that's how you reach discernment. Um, now, the, the, the questioner, uh, I don't know who sent the question, was very uh, correct in saying that then how, you know, how do you, could it be <laughs> that some of these so-called grays are real ETs um, and some may not be? Yes, because the intelligence community has been taking both the genetic material but also using stagecraft. In fact, uh, this Air Force intelligence officer talked about uh, taking guys who were uh, some special forces, some very small uh, men, making them up to look like a gray, putting them on a man-made flying saucer with electronic warfare systems, and I know for a fact other chemicals and hallucinogens, and abducting people. Uh, and one example he gave was someone who uh, was in an area of a classified facility where they saw something they shouldn't, and they sent this abduction squad out complete with man-made looking little grays. Uh, now, to the, to the casual person who knows nothing about these counterintelligence capabilities that have been in full development since the 40s and 50s, they would 100% be fooled that it was ET when it was 100% man-made. And this is the crux of the problem, is if we don't have discernment on this, we're never, they're going to be able to fool us. And it's sort of like the who when they wrote, uh, we won't be fooled again. And they wrote that after, you know, we were fooled into Vietnam and all this stuff. Well, in fact, we have been fooled again. And we keep getting fooled. We were fooled on 9-11. We were fooled with the Iraq situation. And unfortunately, we're about to be fooled on the cosmic flag if we don't, wake up and, and begin to learn what these capabilities are that are man-made that can simulate an ET event. And uh, you have to remember 60 years and trillions of dollars of our funding have gone into this false flag capability. And, and so that's very, very important that everyone understand that. Um, and so anyway, that's I'm trying to get through as many of these as I can. Um, the uh, another very good question is how would you protect inventors in case they approach you with their technology? Will open sourcing it be enough? And what are the implications of this? Referring to the previous uh, questions we've been discussing. Well, here's the problem. Um, it's not enough just to open source it. You also have to have a massive public profile. Um, one of the, my frustrations, I was just on the phone uh, th three weeks ago maybe with a man in Arizona who has a astounding over Unity system. He wants to keep it secret. He thinks he's going to put it in megawatt power plants in Alaska and Africa funded by one of the oil emirates. No one will know about it because he's so clever, and it'll save the world. Now, I probably have met several hundred genius inventors like that who 
strategically are so far off the mark. And by the way, every single one of them have been either assassinated, bought out, or the plan has failed. So you have to combine not only open sourcing the technology, pushing it out so it can't be seized, but you have to combine that with a public disclosure initiative that makes the knowledge a household fact. You have to have it streamed on the Internet. You have to have Facebook and Twitter and Mark Zuckerberg and everyone else getting behind it. You have to do – so if someone said, here's a device and $100 million to get it from the prototype to something to run your house, I say, thank you very much. $20 million can go into R&D. $80 million needs to go into public education disclosure of it and getting – at least 2 billion people on the planet aware that it exists. Because if you don't, A, you're a dead man. B, it will be shut down and fall into obscurity. C, it will be absconded and it will be the tree. Someone will steal it in the intelligence community or a big corporation will buy it out and it will be the tree that fell in the woods that nobody heard. And that is what's been happening for decades. The obscurity around these technologies is their Achilles heel. It's why they're able to successfully shut them down. As, as all of you know, well, most of you know, back a few years ago, uh, my, the energy part of our research effort, the Orion Project, was very close to acquiring the Stan Meyer archive. Not only the archive, but the whole warehouse full of operational devices, including not only his water fuel car, but a toroid donut-shaped object that was 100% legitimate electromagnetic free energy that had a national security order placed on it in the 80s. Now, it was sitting in this warehouse. There was an engineering group from Michigan that had millions behind them. We only had a couple hundred thousand. They ended up getting the technology. I said at the time in public interviews, that if they don't disclose it publicly and get the public, and I mean a billion or two people aware of it, they will probably be assassinated. Fast forward three or four years, I get a hysterical call from a man in the British Isles, Lord, I'm not going to say his name, um, and he says, look, I was the guy behind that engineering group in Michigan acquiring the Stan Meyer technologies. They've gotten it operational, but now all of their lives are being threatened. Can you help us? I said, well, I will try. And we had a very long talk. Um, and what happened is that these guys were convinced that they could just get rich off this and do it secretively. So what they were going to do is flee the United States and go to an eco-friendly country. Newsflash, you can go to Mars and these, these assassins are going to find you. So. They did not want to follow my advice. I wrote a three-page memo of what they needed to do instantly, massively disclose the technology, have a large press conference, put it out there so it can be open sourced and reproduced at universities and people all over the world, and get it out and get it dispersed. Because if you detarget yourself, you're not going to be the target because it's, it's – it's spread all over the world. This is what I've done with the Disclosure Project, one of the reasons I'm still alive. So they wouldn't follow that advice because, you know, money is the root of all evil, and they were convinced that they just kept it secret and kept going. They'd be able to be get rich quick and be the next Rockefeller of energy or something stupid. Well, um, I've had it confirmed to me a few months ago that those guys have all been killed. Now, that it's tragic, and I'm quite sure the technologies have vanished. But it doesn't surprise me. When this whole thing went down, I predicted this would happen, but nobody would listen. So anyone listening, or if you know anyone who has one of these technologies who think they're going to outsmart the intelligence community and keep it secret, that they need to keep it small, that they're going to hide it in 15 different patents and no one will figure it out, that there are all these sort of crazy ideas, I can tell you every single one of those ideas will fail. The people will not succeed in getting it out. And the proof of it is that these technologies have been invented and disappeared for over 100 years. So the definition of insanity is, is doing the, the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Now, my frustration is that on a regular basis, every few months, I encounter somebody with an operational technology, or at least so they aver, 
But however, they refuse to follow the strategic advice, in which case there's really not much you can do about it because they're going to fall into the same traps all these other inventors have done uh, going all the way back to the time of Nikola Tesla. So ultimately, you have to open source it, but at the same time, you've got to have it reproduced by credible people, and you need to get folks like Leonardo DiCaprio on your side, who's, in, who's won his Oscar, and in his Oscar talk said, I want to help save the environment. Okay, you need to get, and we can do that now. I can say we can do that now. We could, But trying to get the inventors or the investment group that has developed the technology to go along with that strategy, that has been the problem. So I'm hoping at some point, Someone will listen to our advice. I mean, I'm 25 years into this meeting with folks all over the world. Uh, I have seen these technologies come and go, and they come, they begin to emerge, and then they vanish. Uh, the only ones that don't vanish are the ones that are frauds, and I'm not going to mention those on this phone call, but there, I mean, there are a bunch of them out there that are just complete hoaxes. Um, and the legitimate ones are, uh, unfortunately, fatally flawed in their strategic plan. They may have a, a prototype that works. They don't have a plan to get it out to the world. So that's what we have tried to put together. I continue to meet with people. Um, I'm hoping someday, uh, I was hoping it'd be this year, but it's looking less likely, we'll meet somebody with a legitimate system that can be independently tested, independently reproduced, um, and that can be massively disclosed and put out open source. Uh, we, we'll see, you know, um, uh, but no, to, to the person who asked the question, just open sourcing it would not be enough because it would sit out there, and again, who would know about it? So you're going to have to engage a lot of high-profile people to get on your side. Um, you know, I just saw a great interview with Bono of you too, and there's a member of my team who's, who's friends with him, and uh, he, he was talking about his next big push is try to electrify the African uh, sub-Sahara uh, continent. But, of course, they don't have the funds and the ability to do it without this sort of zero-point energy. India has the same problem. It's a trillion dollars or more just to get the power plants and the electric wires. But if you had a device that would run every village and house or business, you don't need the transmission lines. You don't need the power plants. So... This is something that we need to put together, but ultimately those kind of people don't want to hear an urban myth. They want to see an operational prototype. So my job has been to try to get someone with an operational prototype that will co cooperate with the strategy. And that's a very difficult thing to do because the strategy is very unconventional. Uh, it's not what is normally done with technologies. Uh, and it certainly isn't done in venture capital, what I call the money whores, who are, of course, a big part of the problem. Uh, they want everything to be secret. But, of course, you can do that with a new iPhone. You can't do it with something as explosive as a free energy device. Um, so the strategy that they try to replicate that works for uh, a new software package or an app or an iPhone, you cannot apply that business thinking and strategy to something as disruptive as a free energy device. So that's what we've been trying to advise people and. So far, nobody with a legitimate device has accepted our advice. So that's where we are. So that's uh, th those are some of the, the things that have come in. I know it's uh, it's almost a, an hour. I hope this is I mean, a quick hour through a lot of issues. I hope it's been uh, helpful and useful to people. This is uh, really an exciting time. I want to thank everyone again for your support. Uh, all over the world. It's really been touching. I mean, the donations have been from $5 to $111,000 on this project. And we're now pushing 650000 which is going to make us one of the top crowdfunded independent projects in the, the world um, on, for a film. I also want to tell you that the book um, is, we're, I talked to Steve Alton today, who's going to uh, collaborate with me on the book. We hope the book will come out around the same time as the film. It may be a little bit later, but we're hoping right now it can be around the same time in late February or March. So um, I'm hoping by the early January we'll have that book completed and 
that also is a massive undertaking. Uh, I, I don't talk about it as much as the film, but it's you know you're talking thousands of pages of top secret witness transcripts and government documents being boiled down to a 400 page book. I mean it's it's an enormous undertaking. But um, that's that's another project I'll be working on more heavily as this film begins to to get wrapped up. So again, I'd like to wish everyone a good night and thank you for your support. If you want to continue to support us or know people who do, we're going to keep the crowdfunding and send a program going until October 20th. And if those of you who can join me at UNLV on November 13th from 7 to 10 p.m. at the Greenspun Auditorium, I hope to see you there. And you'll soon be getting an email from us about the, the, the full details of that, as well as the webinar for those of you who can't be there in person. All right, thank you so much, and have a good night. Bye-bye.